So in the showroom, we actually have a wall of medical skeletons that actually show the progression of how they've evolved over the last hundred years. Relating to the archival video we did on our channel, we're now looking at archival documents as well as the physical skeleton. It helps us tell a much better picture about the medical bone trade as a whole. So for the focus of today's video, we actually are looking primarily only at fully articulated medical skeletons. This here is an entire medical skeleton that dates back roughly to the 50s to the 80s. And let's actually look at how we identify the provenance and history of each individual skeleton. Now, when you're looking at a medical skeleton from a historical standpoint, here are some of the key features you need to look at and able to identify it. The first part is actually the calvarium and the jewelry. So now there's a common term that I talk about in a lot of videos called jewelry. This is typically slang in the bone industry on actually the latches and hardware used to articulate the skeleton. Looking at this original Clay Adams skeleton, common jewelry includes the spring holding the mandible up on the skull, the latch that holds the calvarium cut and the skull cap to the top of the skull, as well as the nuts and rivets that hold the skeleton together. These can be seen within the sternum, arms, legs, and pelvis. Now, looking broadly at the skeleton, the most common pieces of jewelry that you wanna look at are actually the hinges that hold the skull cap to the skull with the calvarium cut, the hinge mandible, and the spring that holds it in place, as well as the wing nuts in the pelvis, femur, and humerus. We just got this medical skeleton in, so the first thing that we wanted to look at is context. This skeleton was sold to me actually by a massage therapist. Their shop had unfortunately closed down during the pandemic, and they used to use this medical skeleton to teach their clients about different pain points in the body. They said that they purchased the skeleton from around the 70s to the 80s, so that gives a context and framework for where the skeleton is from and what company could have produced it. Now let's start with the skull. Looking at the skull, it comes with a calvarium cut. Usually skeletons with calvarium cuts are in the later half of the century. Typically before 1930s, as you'll see later in the video, skulls were actually uncut. So that's one thing that could indicate age of a skeleton. Let's start with this skeleton here. We're gonna do a demo of it and I'm gonna show you how I would analyze this skeleton so you can see it at home, a little bit how I do it here at the showroom. Starting off with the skull, as we just talked about, this skull comes with a calvarium cut. It also has a small little pin here, so we know at one point there was a mandible on this skeleton, but it got lost in time. When I actually asked the original owner, they said that even when they purchased it, they didn't have it. If we look here at the latch holding the skull cap on, it's a very stylized latch, and there's only one company that made skulls with this type of latch. So the second I identified it, I almost instantly knew what company produced the skeleton. So I'm gonna speed round a couple of the characteristics of the skull and what we know and don't know. Sometimes if you look at the back of the skull right here, there's oftentimes a maker's mark or stamp that tells me if it was created by the company Clay Adams. This one does not have it, so we can rule that out. And there's no mandible, so that's about as much as we can tell from the skull as well as the calvarium cut and the wing nut right here. So this is what we can tell just from looking at the skull. Let's move on. The next part is actually padding. If we look here in the inner vertebral discs, which is what you see between the spine, this is a very distinct color padding that was also only used by one company. We have a skeleton that we'll talk about later in the video that has very distinct black padding within their vertebrae. This was also only done by one company in the 70s. So once we see that in a skeleton, we instantly know what company produced it. This one also has extreme padding between the scapula and the humerus. This is really interesting because most medical skeletons don't have it. This one is quite brittle due to age, so it also tells me a little bit about where the skeleton could be from. Most of the time, felt padding was used from around 1910 to 1940. We start to see a transition to foam later in the 50s. So this kind of puts this skeleton within context of the period. The next thing we want to look at here is actually the costal cartilage. This is the sternum and the ribs, which is both bone, but the parts in between it are actually synthetic on most skeletons. This is called the costal cartilage. Now, if we look here, this one appears to be made out of leather. When identifying skeletons, this is one of the biggest things that we look at when trying to figure out what company produced it because it's just so stylized for each individual company. This one here is actually checking all the boxes because if we see this cracking on the sternum, there's only one company 
that did a shat job making them and they did not live up to the test of time. And all of the sternums that I've seen from this company has this cracking in it. So this is another indication to what company produced it. This is more nuanced, but then the next thing you wanna look at is how the radius and the ulna turn. Some companies allow for the skeleton to do this, others don't. Fun fact at home, did you know that your arm bones actually cross? When you hold your arm up, put your thumb here and actually turn your palms up you can actually feel your bones cross over one another. This is why when you actually do x-rays, they make you put your palms up and the correct anatomical position is palms up when you're articulating a skeleton in a forensic anthropological standpoint to make sure that the radiuses and ulnas aren't crossed. Next, we're gonna take a look at the pelvis. Oftentimes for medical skeletons, they have very particular screws in the back. This one is a hexagonal screw with a washer. Some of the older ones that we see from the 19th century, around 1910, use square. Then they eventually do hexagon. We've also seen uh, washers that have eight sides. So looking at it is very important when identifying where it's from. After this, you wanna look at the articulations in the feet and how they actually pin in the feet, as well as how they pin the femur to the tibia. Grand reveal, this is most likely presumed to be a clay atom skeleton. I know for a fact that this is a clay atom skeleton based on how it was prepared. So looking at all of the different things, clay atom sternums have this very stylized preparation that I've only seen documented within their original pieces as well as a super stylized latch. We actually interviewed an original Clay Adams articulator that used to work on the bone room in the 70s, and she told us a little bit about the styles of how they prepared the skeletons, and it was through this interview it gave us a lot of insight on how to identify who and what prepared the skeleton. So if we look at the pin that's attaching the foot to the tibia and fibula, you can actually see this very stylized circle to it. If we look at this confirmed Clay Adams skeleton, it actually has the exact same pin. This pin here was only used by a couple medical companies and was part of the key deciding factor on identifying this skeleton when I was looking at it. For quick context, I'm receiving my BFA at Parsons School of Design, studying product design. So I've taken multiple courses in the history of manufacturing. So applying my understanding of the design process and the manufacturing process allows me to better look at the skeleton and identify such nuanced things that most people would miss based on my degree. So this really helps me identify parts of the skeletal history. So a couple quick call outs. This skeleton behind me is confirmed to be 100% a Clay Adams skeleton. It fortunately enough came with the original base that has a plaque that is titled Clay Adams. The original individual that sold to me, their father was a physician and purchased it in the 40s. So I have a verbal history that was told to me by the original owner, as well as confirming it with my own sources on where it came from but it's almost 100% confirmed with the plaque. Now, one thing I wanted to point out about this is it also has a very stylized latch that's almost one-to-one -one with the modern Clay Adams piece. And if we look at the screw here, the head has a very stylized circle to it, and it also applies and is the same one on the modern counterpart. So Clay Adams has some of the most stylized skeletons, so we can almost instantly pick it out based on the preparation methods. And the last cream of the crop to confirm it in relation to the archival documents video, we have an original Clay Adams purchase catalog that has photos of the original skeletons as well as dates. So once again, all we do is compare and contrast here at the business, we are able to confirm this. So to summarize, looking at this entire skeleton, first of all, like and subscribe. To summarize, looking at this entire skeleton, you wanna look at the connection points of how the bones were articulated. This is your best chance of actually figuring out what produced the skeleton, if that's something you even care about. But people always like to ask, where do the bones come from? And I tell you where the bones come from, no one cares. So this is the video for anyone that cares. All right, now just to be aware when looking at skeletons, you always wanna be careful about speaking in absolutes unless on examples like this where you physically have the company printed on the skeleton, you always have to take it with a grain of salt. For instance, once we get into around the 70s when a lot of the medical skeletons were being produced in India, they would be fully assembled and skeletonized and cleaned in India and then sold to multiple medical companies in the US and the UK. Here's where we start to see multiple companies that have similar skeletons. 
Sometimes they're unique, sometimes they're not. So you always wanna be aware of this history when you look at dating the provenance of these pieces. This here is an original Kilgore International catalog and let's take a look inside real fast. So if we look here in this Kilgore International catalog, they have a fully articulated explanatory skeleton and it actually has the black intervertebral disc that I described earlier in the video and a very stylized costal cartilage preparation. So actually comparing and contrasting what we've seen in archival documents with what we know to be true today, we're actually able to figure out more of this information. This skeleton is a fun skeleton because it had severe damage that the previous owner tried to repair. So this piece is not original. So what we have to do in this case is actually identify what is an original piece of metal work. What are the original connections and what aren't? For instance, this femur here is held on with metal wire, but this is actually the original jewelry here. Now, what we are able to figure out when I actually took this apart, there's a spring that runs on the inside of the femur. There's only one major company that would actually have springs in their femurs of the skeletons, and that was Clay Adams. That coupled with the pin in the foot and the sternum, all of the things look good. Even with the lack of hardware, we were able to figure out that this is most likely a Clay Adams skeleton. Now, what was fascinating was we actually found another bone company that had a skeleton with the exact same preparation, but it had the Clay Adams logo on the pelvis. And if we look here, there's indication that something was pulled off here because of the color change, but that was probably an original label there at one point that fell off. So this is how we figured out the information on this skeleton. So behind me, we actually have a rage. <laughs> this wall shows the process of how skeletal articulation has improved over the last hundred years. What's helpful when looking at the wall is it allows us to visualize how skeletons look pre-19th century and post-19th century. Starting with the skeleton farthest on the left, it's one of the earliest examples we had. I'm still currently working with forensic anthropologists on dating what period the skeleton came from. So this skeleton is presumed right now to be from the 1850s. As more technology improves and we learn more about this individual piece, we might change or amend the dates in the future. This next skeleton is an original Oddfellow skeleton and this dates back to 1890. After that, we have an original Adam Ruley medical skeleton that dates back to 1920, and this has been confirmed. This is an original DeNoyer Geppert skeleton from 1940 based out of Chicago. So many of you guys were asking in the comments what we were gonna do with this entire skeleton that we acquired in a previous video. So we're so happy to announce that it's actually up on the skeleton wall. If you wanted to watch that original unboxing video, you could see it right up here. This year, we're going back to Adam Ruley based in 1970. And this last one is an original Carolina biological supply skeleton from 1984. Here are some characteristics I wanted to point out on the skeletons when we look at different periods. The two skeletons above me are called original beef jerky preparations when we look at the costal cartilage. This is because the original cartilage has been preserved and dried with the skeleton. Later, synthetic cartilage or fake cartilage was used in future preparations. This Adam Ruley skeleton behind me dating back to 1920, we looked at the company's original bio and saw this very skeleton on display. It also has the original seal on the back of the pelvis, and this is how we were able to identify what period it was from. The costal cartilage in the sternum was a type of paper mache, commonly seen in Millikan and Lolly and Adam Ruley dating back to around 1920 to 1930. Looking back at the tall skeleton that was next to me earlier in the video, that one also had a leather cartilage. The one above me from Denoya Geppert also had a leather cartilage. This was very common in the 40s to the 50s. So whenever we see leather, we usually date it within that period. Once again, there are exceptions to every rule, so never take one piece of information as gospel. You have to look at the entire composition, historical context, archival research to really make an informed decision. Now moving over to the 70s and 80s, they began to switch over to a resin synthetic composite. This Adam Ruley skeleton behind me actually also has black intervertebral discs, which is very common for Adam Ruley at the time. Looking at the sternum, this one actually has a resin composite skeleton. And finally, let's take a look at the most modern skeleton. This skeleton behind me is an original Carolina biological supply skeleton. It's most famous for having stainless steel hardware and very noticeable glue ups 
in the sternum as well as the clavicles. Carolina Biological Supply is one of the only companies that have done skeletal articulations with this very noticeable glue. So the second you see it, it's almost indicative that it's an original Carolina Biological Supply skeleton. One last call out I wanted to make when looking at the wall of skeletons is the transformation from copper to brass to eventually stainless steel. Originally, a lot of the skeletons in the 19th century used brass and later in the 1980s, they moved over to stainless steel. So this is a great tool we use to dating the skeletons is what kind of metal was used in the articulation. So how do I know all this? I've spent the last five years researching the medical bone trade and all the various skeletons that can be seen within it. And I've seen hundreds and hundreds of skeletons. So over the years, seeing so many pieces that have come up in the market, I've began to develop an archive of known and unknown skeletal preparations. And after seeing so much, I'm able to look at a skeleton and very quickly and competently identify what the producer and possible manufacturer that prepared the skeleton was. But just to absolutely confirm, this is actually a Carolina Biological Supply Skeleton pamphlet. It shows some of the original models that they used to sell back in the 80s. Now, if we open it up and take a look on the inside, you can see the exact style of skeleton that's behind me in this catalog. So with the original branding and the one-to-one -one comparisons, this is how we 100% confirm the history and the provenance. It's once again looking at archival photos and context to uncover it. So that covers how we are able to analyze and identify where a skeleton comes from. Unfortunately enough, within this history, it's been so underdocumented. Being able to make more educational video about the history and provenance and some of the companies surrounding this trade is extremely important to us here at John's Bones. Because there's been so little academic work related to actually documenting and archiving these pieces, it's always like uncovering a mystery, trying to figure out where and what period of time this skeleton came from. When it comes to the medical bone trade, there's really two parts of the history. The original sourcing and where the bones went after they were processed. Here at the business, we focus primarily more on the secondary parts of this, on the companies that actually purchased the skeletons and what those companies did with it. This is primarily what we specialize with here at the business. And I hope this inspires you guys to go out and do your own research in the future. And if you ever have any more questions, feel free to comment them below and I'll do my best to respond. So be sure to like and subscribe for more and ciao everyone.